Welcome to Dive Wreck Valley. Today we're going to go lobstering on the Steel Wreck, an unidentified schooner sitting in about 75 feet of water, five miles out of Jones Inlet, Long Island, New York. I'm going to be diving with my good friend Captain Steve Belinda on his 59th birthday. So stay with us. Dive Wreck Valley will be right back. On a Wednesday morning, we begin to load our dive equipment aboard the research vessel Wreck Valley. Predicted weather conditions look decent today, and we're all anxious to get underway. Working with me to film today's show is my friend and cameraman Steve Belinda, divers Ed Janay, Captain John Lackemeyer, Mike McMeekin, and Hank Garvin. The dive boat Wreck Valley is a 34-foot fiberglass downeaster that's powered by a single Volvo diesel engine. The Wreck Valley cruises at 12 knots and is more than roomy enough for our divers and equipment. The steel wreck is a small unidentified wreck. Captain John has visited this site many times over the years, so let's ask him about her history. All right, the wreck's in about 75 foot of water, and it's sort of in a wedge shape, uh, where the one end comes up about four feet with a full tank or something at that end, and the ribs come up sort of like in fingers at the high end. And I don't know why, but it's like it's spread out like a, sort of a V or something. Steel wreck or wood wreck? It's a wood wreck with this, like, steel pieces on it. I think it was carrying bed springs. That's why they call it a steel wreck. Okay. Okay. Uh, How many feet of water? It's about 75. There are pieces off the wreck, which only I know which direction to go. For real. <laughs> okay. I think it's west, though. But it runs about... I guess 50 feet east-west, okay, with a high end, I believe, on the west side, and then another 40 feet sort of uh, northeast, I guess, the other part of me. And in the middle, it, <laughs> in the middle is um, like a, a raised section. There's like a piece of steel in the section in the middle, okay. And I didn't go there last year at all. So I don't know why changed, but I understand it's sort of getting uncomfortable. That's, that's what I heard. That's why we're going today. Yes, uh, no, my old boat on a Ron Berwick found an octagon porthole on it. Really? It's the only one I've ever seen come off the wreck. Wow. It's usually a lobster wreck, and uh, I found a couple of flashlights on it, that kind of thing. You what, know? what about the bottom composition? Is it sand bottom or mud? Or? No, it's, it's basically sand. Okay. Okay. Good visibility in the area? Barriers. I've been down there where you can look up and see the boat, and I've been down there where I can't see you two feet away, you know. Okay. Well, that's normal. That's part, yeah, right. part of the course. Well, I usually enjoy it because not too many people hit it. The steel wreck lies only a few miles out of Jones Inlet. So before long, the wreck valley is anchored over the site, and it's time to suit up and go diving. We actually made several trips to this wreck while filming today's show. One trip was relatively calm, while the others were all a bit windy. Steve, when was the last time you were on this wreck? Last time I was on this wreck was in the 60s. We were out here at Carl Helwig's boat. I had myself, Al Bone, uh, Mike Anisman, Ron Pringle, and Carl Helwig. We were anchored up, and it started blowing. And before you know it, we were like six to eight foot seas here. And uh, Carl decided to abort the dive when we started to stretch out the half-inch nylon to a point where it looked like quarter-inch line. That's the last time I was, I was on this site. Now, you got the bell off this wreck, don't yes. you? Yes, I have the bell from the 60s, yeah. No writing on there's it? No writing on it, there's no identification. This is always an excellent lobster wreck. This was, uh, it wasn't good for Mungle. And finding a bell, which was broken and everything, was really amazing, because we never found anything uh, you know, on this wreck at all. This was just, we would always stop here, 75, 80 foot of water, coming back from one of the deeper wrecks, uh, just to clean up some lobsters to bring home. Any idea what kind of wreck it is? What kind nope. of vessel it was? Nope, they nicknamed it the steel wreck because at one time there was a lot of bales of, uh, like, wire laugh and stuff on it. And then it got nicknamed the steel wreck and that was it. John, when was the last time you were on this wreck? Two years ago. Two years? Yeah. It was sanded over then? Well, it wasn't as clear as what Jim was saying. Jim was saying you could swim around and see ribs all the way around. You never used to be able to. So it sounds like the one end, the real low end, got uncovered. Underneath? Yeah. Well, Steve, this is kind of early in the season for lobsters also. Have you found any uh, best time of the year for lobstering, or do you think they'll be there today? Usually, the, you know, 
know, lobsters move with the water temperature, and they don't start moving until after the water temperature gets over about 42 degrees. But from what I understand, this has been a good year. I mean, you were here last week, and you guys cleaned up with a bunch of lobsters. Uh, John was telling me on the G and D they got uh, quite a few, and we picked a bunch off the San Diego Sunday. So lobsters seem to be in early this season. Well, we had a mild winter. That might have had something yeah, to it. Yeah, could definitely be. But the water temperature is about 46 degrees, 48 degrees on the bottom. So the lobsters are moving. There's a lot of egg barren lobsters. Yeah, yeah, we noticed that. There's also quite a few little wrecks around here. The stone barge and you know, you got the, the artificial barge, reef. You got the wreck, you got the steel wreck, you got a couple other barges, a couple of no names. This is a nice, nice little area right here, four, five, six miles, you know, right outside of Jones Inlet. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a haven for the, for the wreck driver to come out lobster. And the lobsters migrate from one wreck to the other? Yes, they do. They, they move all over. They, they, you know, I don't know if we get a marsh like they do on the, the southern Louisiana, but uh, they, they migrate from wreck to wreck. Before long, we're all suited up and it's time to take the plunge. Scuba diving is certainly an equipment extensive sport, but once in the water, the gear is almost weightless. One by one, we each make our way to the Wreck Valley swim platform and jump into the clear but chilly Atlantic, eager to see what adventures await us below. Stay tuned. When Dive Wreck Valley returns, we'll be descending to explore the remains of the steel wreck. Before we get back to the show, I'd like to introduce you to a brand new product that's just hit the market. It's called the C-Scan PC Side Scan Sonar. It's put out by a company called Marine Sonic Technology in Virginia. And it utilizes a personal computer as well as a towfish in order to give you beautiful images of the shipwrecks as they appear on the ocean floor. This system is also unique because it enables us to enlarge the images as well as measure the images, giving us more information than we've ever had before without putting a diver into the water. For additional information on the C-Scan Side Scan Sonar, contact Marine Sonic Technologies Direct at 1-800-447-4804. Now let's get back to the show. As we descend through the translucent Atlantic, we find that conditions are actually quite good today. Horizontal visibility is about 20 to 30 feet, which is more than enough for filming and navigation on this low-lying wreck site. Although visibility is good, it's still early in the season, and the bottom temperature is only a chilling 39 degrees. The grapple anchor has landed on the wooden ribs on the wreck's port side. Ed Janae's job on this dive, as a mate aboard the wreck valley, is to secure the grapple into the wreck. The grapple must be firmly tied to the wreck, so it won't break free while we're filming below. Ed secures the grapple to the wreck with a rope. In essence, he's created a mooring line from the wreck valley to the shipwreck. For divers to descend on. Once the grapple is secured, Ed's job is complete. Steve Belinda has also descended to the wreck and begins to search the wreck's perimeter for lobsters. This wreck is almost completely covered in marine growth. The wooden beams and planks of her hull are heavily blanketed with anemones. Steve has captured a small lobster. It's released to return to its home on the wreck and grow larger. I've always enjoyed watching these little critters maneuvering within their own natural environment. Most shipwrecks in the Northeast developed into thriving artificial reefs by providing structure for marine growth on an otherwise barren seabed. The steel wreck is no exception. In fact, most area shipwrecks are like little oases in the middle of a barren desert of sand. Anemones adhere to the solid structure, crustaceans make their homes within their ribs, and basically they support their own little mini ecosystem. This will be Ed's first attempt at lobster diving. It's not long before the first bug is spotted. Ed positions himself and lunges at the bug, but this one was just a bit too fast. Steve finds that crabs are also making their home around this wooden wreck site. Meanwhile, Ed has spotted another lobster. Again, he carefully approaches and lunges his arm deep into the lobster's hole. No one ever told Ed it was going to be easy, but once again, the lobster was just a bit too fast. It's now my turn to show Ed just how it's done. After reaching deep into the wreck's ribs, I retrieve a nice little bug. Unfortunately, it's a female with eggs. A lobster's eggs are carried externally under a female's tail. These lobsters must be handled carefully and released to ensure a continuing population for future years. 
Ed has skillfully spotted yet another lobster. Once again, he positions himself and makes the lunge. Persistence is certainly the key to success, but again, the lobster's reflexes were just a bit too quick. Meanwhile, Steve has found what appears to be mast hoops. These are one of the few landmarks on the site and are also one of the only clues leading to our speculation that this was once a sailing vessel. Only a few feet away, I've caught a nice sized lobster. This one will certainly make a nice meal after a long day of diving. Note that I insert the bug tail first into my mesh bug bag. This ensures that he'll swim into and not out of the bag in any escape attempt. Ed has also spotted one more bug and reaches deep into his hole. Ed's lobster is a bit too short to keep. These little lobsters are at many times much more tenacious or possibly just a little dumber than their larger counterparts. Imagine a little six inch lobster brazen enough to attack what must appear to him to be a 200 pound alien. In the end, the lobster has to be pulled off my video housing and then it slowly meanders away in absolutely no rush to escape. If only it knew that its small size is all that saved it from becoming a dinner to a hungry diver. To explore wrecks and search their remains is a fascinating adventure that's only possible through the sport of scuba diving. Divers are a very lucky bunch. The beauty, thrill, and excitement of the underwater world is something that our landlocked counterparts may never truly appreciate. Scuba diving is fast becoming the sport of the 90s. Modern equipment and training methods have made the sport not only safe, but much more enjoyable. If you're not already a certified diver, contact your local dive store today and learn just how easy it is to get certified and start exploring our beautiful underwater world. Unaffected by his earlier failures, Ed is determined to come home with a lobster dinner. This time, he carefully positions himself so he can thrust his arm deep into the lobster's hole. Once inside, the lobster will surely defend himself by biting at the approaching hand. He will also forcefully push his body upward, wedging himself between the floor and the ceiling. The diver must hold down the claws while trying to get a good grip of the bug's body. Pulling on the claws is not recommended, as it usually only results in the lobster releasing a claw. This time, Ed has his hand in good position, and before long, emerges the victor with his first lobster. Along the wreck's port side, divers will recognize the remains of a dragger's lost fish net. These nets can cause an entanglement to an uncareful diver and are better off avoided. In the wreck's bow, divers will recognize her winch, which is now laying on its side in the sand. This wreckage also provides the highest relief on the site. Conga eels are also abundant here and can be found within every hole not inhabited by a lobster. This bolicleet is one of the key recognizable landmarks divers use on this site as a navigational reference. But be careful, there's an identical bolid on the other end of the wreck, which can very easily trick a diver. Ed has spotted yet another lobster. Once again, the hunter goes to work, but this time with the skill of a seasoned lobster diver. Within only a few minutes, Ed retrieves his second lobster of the day. Most of the Wreck Valley dive team chooses to wear dry suits for thermal protection while exploring Northeast shipwrecks. The crushed neoprene suits we use are actually quite comfortable and require less lead to offset the positive buoyancy of conventional dry suits. Dry suits are always highly recommended for warmth and comfort on any of Wreck Valley's intermediate and deeper shipwrecks. Steve has also spotted a bug and quickly grabs the little crustacean. This one, like mine earlier, has eggs and will be released to return to its home on the wreck. Our planned bottom time is beginning to quickly run low, and it's now time to start to head back towards the wreck valley's anchor. On the way, we find yet another lost net tangled on the wreck's wooden ribs. It's now time to start our slow ascent towards the surface. At 20 feet, we stop for our first safety decompression hang. Steve is utilizing a new John line clip that allows him to quickly and securely attach his John line to our anchor line. John lines allow divers to stay at a constant depth through neutral buoyancy, even when the anchor line is moving up and down in heavy seas. Stay tuned. When Dive Wreck Valley returns, we'll be climbing back aboard the research vessel Wreck Valley. After our dive, it's time to climb back aboard and take a closer look at our lobsters. 
We had one. We saw one lobster on the wreck. That's it? Yeah. No, no, we no, got, we got three. One. But there was one really big one there. It was sitting there, contemplating how to it get this thing out. It was deep in a hole. Until yeah. we realized this thing, you know, it looked like it was about seven pounds, eight pounds. Yeah, and you couldn't get it. The hole was he's big. Oh, like so we're going, you know, looking around for other ways into the hole to get him. The, but anch the anchor down. He's big. Come right here. Sit right here, John. He was really nice size. His claws were huge. This was all the way in the front. Or at the, the end. Hank Garvin has captured the biggest lobster of the day. This bug must weigh seven to eight pounds and will certainly make a delicious dinner. You think so? A few days after this dive, we returned to the site and put the new marine sonic side scan sonar to the test. We wanted to learn as much as possible about the wreck's size and actual layout. The results were